Amen. So, uh, Daniel chapter 4, of course, is a very uh, famous uh, passage of Scripture. Probably most people in the room are familiar with it. Um, if you're not, you know, it doesn't take very long until you hear preaching on it. And it's just a very, uh, you know, one of my more favorite stories that, that I read. You know, whenever uh, you read that part about Nebuchadnezzar, you know, being put out in the field, and you get that visual of, you know, his, eagle, his, his hair growing as eagle feathers and his nails becoming like eagle claws and him, you know, eating grass as oxen. I mean, what a sight to see a man of such, you know, power and dignity and majesty brought so low and, and, and humbled in such a way. But uh, what he had, what the problem with Nebuchadnezzar and what he had was he had a, dim, a dismissive attitude. I mean, he received a very clear warning from the man of God and from God directly. I mean, he was given a vision. You know, God doesn't do that to just everybody. God gives him this very powerful vision that troubles him so much that he has to bring in all these men to try and interpret it. And when he finally has it interpreted, you know, it's, it's a strong uh, warning. Like, hey, this is, you're headed for trouble. You know, this, uh, nothing good is going to come of uh, the direction that you're headed. And, of course, he develops a, dim a dismissive attitude. And that's what I want to preach to you about this morning is the danger of a dismissive attitude, the danger of having a dismissive attitude. And what do I mean by a dismissive attitude? Well, if you think about at the end of the service, I often say, uh, thank you for coming, everybody. We are dismissed, right? And what am I saying? I'm saying, well, it's over. You know, you can disregard uh, the service now. It's, it's done. It's finished. And sometimes we as human beings, we can develop a dismissive attitude towards things by just saying, you know, well, I'm not going to pay attention to that. It's over. That's not going to, it no longer has any, uh, you know, power with me. It's never, it's not going to be something that I regard. Okay. It's, it's you disregard it. You're dismissive. <clears throat> and this is the example that we see of Nebuchadnezzar. And he starts out, now I believe that Nebuchadnezzar is a saved man. And I believe that this passage, we see him uh, become a, a, a believer, that he actually become, that we'll meet Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. In fact, he'd probably be an interesting guy to talk to. So, uh, but the example of Nebuchadnezzar, he's a lost man who is dismissive of the warning that he received. You know, and so we could apply this attitude to people out there who are unsaved. You know, the unsaved ought to be careful about how dismissive they are with the gospel. And uh, because there's going to come a point, you know, where, where you, you hear it and you hear it and you hear it and you hear it. And if you continue to disregard it and you decide not to retain God in your knowledge and just dismiss it out of hand over and over again, there just might come a time when God decides to dismiss them as well. But, you know, that's not the case with Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, we understand that he got saved and we read about the process of him getting saved in this chapter. Now, if you read, you say, well, I'm not so sure about him being saved. Well, look at verses one through three, okay? And, and tell me these aren't the words of a saved man. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. So first of all, you know, he's trying to get this message out to everybody. And it kind of reminds me of the charge that we have as New Testament believers to preach the gospel to every creature. And that that is something that he wants to accomplish as well. He says in verse 2, I thought it good to show the signs and the wonders that the high, the high God, okay, hath wrought toward me, how, are his, uh, how great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. Okay, so he's saying, who was it that showed these signs and wonders to him? It was the high God. Now notice, you know, in verse 37 as well. He says, now, okay, so he's at the end of the story he's saying, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. Right, he's singular, it's singular. He's saying, the high God, the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. So you're starting out with the introduction, him, you know, telling what he's about, you know, going into, and he's giving his introduction, and he's, he's extolling the high God, right? And now at, towards the end, he's also extolling the high God of heaven. Compare that with verse 9, where he's in the story, where he's looking back at this time and telling the story. And he says in verse 9, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods, plural, is in thee. And no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. So he's looking back at this time in his life in chapter 4. And, he, and when we look back, there's a time when he's just saying, oh, he's just one of the holy gods. But on the ends, after the story has run its course, you know, he's saying the high God. So I believe that's evidence in the language of the chapter itself that points to the fact that Nebuchadnezzar is saved. Now, you don't have to agree with me on that. You know, you could say, well, I, I kind of doubt it, you know, the, and it's one of the, 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 the you know, the, the minor points of Scripture. You know, it's not a, essential, you know, but that's my opinion. I believe he was a saved man. <clears throat> so in Daniel, 
he interprets the dream here in verses 20 through 26, and the king is given a clear warning, right, of the direction uh, that he is headed and the punishment that is going to be doled out to him. I mean, it's just spelled out plain as the nose on his face that, hey, you know, God's going to deal with you and it's not going to be pretty. And he's being given a very uh, stern warning, right? What's that warning again? We kind of talked about it already. It says, they shall drive thee, for verse 25, they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times, meaning seven years, shall pass over thee, till thou wilt know that thou, most high God ruleth in the kingdom of men, and give it to whomsoever he will. Man, I would want that for seven minutes. And he got it for seven years out there. And people seeing him, what a, what a, you know, what a reproach. I mean, imagine the kids seeing that, all the, all the laughing and scorn that must have gone on while this was taking place. But despite this warning, you know, very specific, very clear warning, uh, Nebuchadnezzar continues in his pride and is punished in, in the exact same manner that was foretold. He's, he hears the warning and he just continues right on in his pride. And it says in verse 28, and all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. Now it's talking about you know, everything that just happened. The, the dream, the prophecy, the interpretation. All of this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the, uh, of the kingdom of Babylon. So maybe at the first, you know, he might have said, whoa, I should take heed. We don't really know. But after the process of time, 12 months, a year later, is when things finally start to play out. You know, maybe he wasn't dismissive right away, but we know that, you know, time has a way of dulling our hearing. You know, we start to, you know, we, we say, we hear a warning, you know, we're warned, don't do this again. If you mess up, that's it. You know, you're going to be punished in some way, shape, or form. And for a little while, you know, we're on eggshells. We're being real careful about how we do things because we don't want the hammer to come down on us. But after time, people get lax and people start to let things go and they kind of slip back into their old ways and they become dismissive of the warning that they have. They get a dismissive attitude. And that is a very dangerous thing to do because then the punishment does come. But of course, we know the story here. Fortunately, he learns his lesson the hard way and he is restored. You know, God is merciful unto him. Doesn't just leave him out, in the, out there in the, to eat grass for the rest of his life like some kind of an animal. Gives him back his mind and he, and he humbles himself and he comes back, verses 34 and, and onwards, where he receives his kingdom. <laughs> but here's the thing about this. You have to read the story and wonder, could he have avoided those seven years? Uh, I mean, that's seven years wasted, in my opinion. I mean, what could he have done in his kingdom with seven years? He probably could have accomplished a lot. I mean, if I were to come to any one of you and say, hey, we're just going to take seven years of your life away, you know, that would probably upset you. you know, and, and you've got to wonder what would happen if he had just given heed to the warning. You know, he would have been able to hang on to those seven years and done something and never had to suffer this punishment. And that's, that, what this is showing us is just how quickly people become complacent and careless and dismissive over time. It's at the end of 12 months. You know, he reminds me of, you know, the proverbial know-it-all teenager, right? The one that just got it all figured out. You know, they'll listen to mom, they'll listen to dad as they're coming up, but they hit a certain age and all of a sudden it's like, hey, I got this. I got it all figured out. I don't need any more help. I don't need any more any advice. And they start to become dismissive. I'm not saying all of them do, but I'm saying this is a prevalency among young people. They, they get to a certain age where they start getting treated like an adult. The world starts to call them adult. You know, even though they might not be doing everything an adult does, but they develop a very know-it-all attitude. And what do they do? They become dismissive of their elders. They stop listening to mom and dad. They stop listening to the preaching. They stop listening to the word of God. And they become dismissive. But here's the thing, you know, uh, you have to understand when you develop this attitude, the danger of having an attitude like that, whether it's as a teenager, as a full-grown adult, whether it's as a, as a child or an employee or, you know, just a Christian who's serving God. When you develop this attitude of just becoming dismissive and just doing your own thing and not giving heed to the Word of God, not listening to the preacher, not listening to the parents, not listening to uh, the, the Bible and the counsel of the Lord, and just dismissing everything and thinking you've got it all figured out, that nothing's going to happen, <coughs> excuse me, that does not excuse you from the fact that everyone reaps what they've sown. There's no escaping from that law in life. 
You know, the, the law of reaping and sowing is just a fact of life. And that can work for you or that can work against you. And the danger is when we develop a dismissive attitude is that we start, we start sowing to the flesh. We start to say, ah, I know the Bible says that, but pff, so what? I'll be all right. What's the worst that could happen? Well, do you really want to roll those dice and find out? Because I don't. Because we've seen other people in our lives, if we've been paying attention, where they have taken that chance. And often it hasn't turned out well for them because they reap what they've sown. The Bible says in Galatians 6, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say you might. He didn't say, hey, if you sow to the flesh, you know, God might just let you go ahead and reap that harvest. He said, you shall reap of the flesh. You shall reap corruption. <clears throat> but he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit, uh, uh, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So that's a, prom that's a warning and a promise in the Word of God. That, you know, if you don't develop a dismissive attitude, if you give heed unto the things that you're instructed by your parents, by the Word of God, on the job, you know, by whoever it is that has something to share, you know, to has some kind of authority in your life, you know, if you give heed to those things, the promise is that you can reap, you know, righteousness, holiness. You're not going to have a bad harvest. And this, you know, that's kind of a whole other message in and of itself, this idea of reaping what you've sown, okay? We go out, people that have sown bad seeds in the past, that harvest comes due and there's no escaping it. Right. You know, as the saying goes, you can't, you can't sow your wild oats and then hope for a crop failure. It's going to come due. So what you can do in the process, even while you are reaping a bad harvest, is start to sow good harvest, uh, good seed. I heard a preacher put it this way once, and I, I always think about it. He talks about, he's from the south, and he, he, I guess they're really big about grass over there which is this green stuff that grows, anyway. But, um, but they, they have different, you know, some people really get into their lawns and they different have, have different types of grass. You know, I really, I, I like the St. Augustine. You know, it's the one I've picked out if I ever want to have a grass. But the, he was talking about, I guess over there, the Joysia grass. I don't know if he's, you know, I didn't look that up. Maybe he's pulling my leg or something. But he's saying, look, some people had the crab grass, some people had, you know, the Kentucky bluegrass, but the grass that everyone really wanted was the Georgia grass. That was the really popular stuff. And the way you would grow this grass is you wouldn't just tear up all the old grass and put the new grass in. This grass would, this Georgia grass could just grow, outgrow everything else. It would just kill everything else over time. And it would just, uh, it would eventually just have a whole, whole grass, a uh, yard full of that grass. So what, he, what he's saying you do is you would just go out and you put a little bit here, and you put a, a plot of joysia here, and a plot of joysia here, and a plot of joysia here. And then you just sit back and wait, water it. And over time, that joysia just takes over and pushes everything else out of the way. And that's a great analogy for life when it comes to this idea of reaping and, uh, sowing, uh, and reaping and sowing, sowing and reaping. You know, we might have some crabgrass in our life, and there's really nothing we can do about it. It's there. We got to look at it. We got to mow it. We got to deal with it. It's the bad seed that we've sown in our past. But in the meantime, we can start putting down little plots of joysia in our life. And we can wait and let that other harvest you know, run its course. And then in time, you know, we'll have a nice yard. We'll have the, the lawn that we want. And that's a good way to approach life if we've got a bad harvest coming due. You know, people often fall into this trap. They just throw up their hands and they just say, what's the point? I've already made so many mistakes. I've already uh, you know, messed everything up so badly. I might as well just, just go right on doing that. But that's not going to make things easier. I mean, do we really think that's going to make life easier, just keep sowing bad seed? Of course not. And we should learn from that, not make those mistakes again, and start to sow some good seed in our lives. Because nobody is, is excused from this law of reaping and sowing. And that's why having a dismissive attitude is so dangerous. Especially when we are those that have, and I talked about this a little bit in Deuteronomy the other night, when we are those that have knowledge of right and wrong, when we are one, those that have been, you know, uh, come up in a godly home or, or part of a, a Baptist church that preaches the word of God, you know, where we've read the Bible, we understand things. What that does is it makes us accountable. And if you would, we looked at it the other day. Actually, you know what? Just go over to, uh, go over to Daniel 5. Just stay, keep over there. 
I'll get through this point quickly. I, we touched on this the other night, but accountability, when you, when you understand and know right from wrong, when you know what the Bible says, when you've been taught and instructed, you know, that just makes you all the more accountable and all the more uh, subject to this law of reaping and sowing because you know better. And we looked at it the other night in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus said, The servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. So you got the servant who knew everything he was supposed to do and did it not. He says he'll be beaten with many stripes. They're both getting beaten, but the guy who's ignorant, who didn't even know what he was supposed to do, no one told him, no one came to him and said, hey, did you, this is your Lord's will, and he did it not, he'll be beaten with few stripes. It's the knowledge, the understanding of, what we're, of knowing right from wrong and what we're supposed to do. When we do it not, that makes us more accountable and, more sub, and subject to a more severe punishment. I mean, that's kind of what we saw in Nebuchadnezzar, right? God comes, gives him this vision. A man of God comes and says, this is the vision. This is exactly what's going to happen if you continue on. And you, you know, I'm kind of getting my head of myself, but you could see in that passage, if you notice, Daniel's kind of imploring him, hey, you know, break off thy sins by righteousness. If it be a, you know, a, a continuing of thy tranquility. You know, he's kind of warning the king and saying, hey, I don't want this for you. Right? But the king, you know, he's got this vision. He's got the interpretation. What is he? He's accountable. He knew his Lord's will. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what he was going to reap if he went and sowed that seed. And he sowed it anyways. And that's a pretty severe punishment, if you ask me. I mean, he's out there eating grass like the ox, you know, and, and basically loses his mind. And I believe that God, even to this day, strikes people with madness. Maybe not to that degree. And people, and you know, this is especially true of people who reject the gospel over and over again. You know, today is the day of salvation for a lot of people. When we go knock on some people's doors and we say, hey, this is your chance. You know, and they'll say, oh, I'll do it later. I know what it says, but not today. I'm not interested. I understand exactly what you're telling me, that salvation is by grace through faith, that I'm a sinner, that I need a Savior. And I understand that. They get it. They know what it means to be saved. And they say, no, I'll do it later. Look, they don't know if later is going to come. God just might say, well, you know what? Next time someone comes to your door and knocks on it, you won't understand it. You won't get it. Because no man cometh to the Father except, uh, except uh, no man cometh unto the Father except he be drawn. I'm, I'm butchering it. Right? Except he draw him. Right? You have to be drawn of the Spirit. The Spirit gives understanding. The Spirit uh, of God comes upon people when, when they hear the preaching of the, Holy, uh, of, the word, of the Word of God. The Holy Ghost comes and ministers to their heart. <clears throat> you know, someone might come next time and bring the same exact message, but there's no Holy Spirit to minister, to bring those words home and make it known. <clears throat> you know, so accountability, you know, makes you all the more, uh, or, uh, or knowing the right from wrong, excuse me, makes you all the more accountable, and being accountable compounds the consequences of disobedience. If you're there in Daniel 5, I think Nebuchadnezzar's son is a great case in point. Nebuchadnezzar's son is somebody who should have known better, right? And we see a similar thing happen to him where God does some, frightens him with some vision or some, like, much like his father, you know? And, and he sees the handwriting come in the wall. You know, they, they went out and they took the vessels of the Lord out of, out of storage and they, they, they were drinking and getting drunk and praising the gods of silver and of stone. They're taking God's vessels and, and worshiping false gods with them and getting drunk with them. And then if you know the story, he sees the writing, the, a, man, a man's hand right on the wall. And it says, you know, meeny, meeny, tiku, you farsen. And he doesn't understand what's being written. But the Bible says even, if you read the story, that his knees, they, 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 they quaked. His knees were slapping together. You ever been that afraid? No one wants to raise their hand. Maybe no one has been that afraid. I've been that afraid. They didn't knock, but man, my legs were shaking. My dad's like, hey, why don't you climb up that tree, take this gas can, this is my dad, take this gas can and go up that tree and pour it on that termite's nest out on that limb. <laughs> so he's got me out there on this limb, like, and it was probably only like 20 feet up, only 20, what's the worst that could happen when you're holding on to a five gallon can of gas? And I'm out there just 
trying, you know, you probably can't see my knees, but my legs are just shaking. He just starts laughing. I love it when your legs shake like that. That's funny. I mean, that's how scared this guy was, Nebuchadnezzar's son. He was so scared that his knees were just clacking. And he says here in Daniel verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 17, excuse me, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts to be thyself. Remember, he had said to him, Hey, if you tell me what this writing is, you know, I'm going to put a gold chain upon your neck, and you'll be third in the kingdom. Yep. And Daniel says, You know what? You go ahead and just keep your gifts, and thy reward to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known unto him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God, Gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor, and for majesty that he gave him, uh, for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he slew, uh, he, and whom he would he slew, and whom he kept he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took him from his glory, his glory from him. You know, it's no, incident, it's no coincidence that, that Daniel's reminding him of all this. He's saying, I'll read the writing, but let me just, let's just review real quick. Let's talk about your dad for a minute. And I want to remind you something. That's what he's doing here. And he says in verse 21, And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Yeah, yeah, I know, Daniel. What's the writing say? I brought you in here telling me the right. Why are you telling me about my dad? Well, there's a reason. Till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and he appointed him over him whomsoever he would. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. He's saying, everything I just told you, you knew. You knew what happened to your dad. You were there. You know, he was probably alive when dad was out eating grass like an ox like a madman. Right. What happened to dad? Oh, he disobeyed God. He got proud. He disobeyed the God of heaven. Oh. He knew all this. And what was he? He was accountable. But thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. You see, the difference here between Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, and Nebuchadnezzar is that Belshazzar wasn't given a second chance, was he? He just drops the hammer on him. You don't see Daniel imploring with him. He just says, you knew all this. Keep your prize. Keep your promotion. You're done. Because yep. you knew all this. You're accountable, man. <clears throat> he knew everything, and he, he wasn't getting a second chance because, or even a direct warning, really, like his father. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was warned. I believe Nebuchadnezzar could have avoided that. But he got dismissive. He got a dismissive attitude. And so did Belshazzar. He got real dismissive, a dismissive attitude about everything that happened to his dad. And you know what? I, I bet if we were, you know, this is all conjecture, but I bet if we could go back and, and, and see everything that played out, I bet those years that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was out there eating like a, you know, just going mad and losing his mind and going through all that, that his son might even been afraid, said, boy, I don't want to mess up like dad. I sure don't want to make that mistake. He might have even said that. But this is what time does to us. Time passes on. Dad dies, goes off the scene. Now I'm king. What was that about? Oh, yeah, well, you know, maybe that was something else with dad, that whole ox thing and, you know, eagles like hair like eagles' feathers. Maybe, maybe that was something else. Maybe, that was, you know, maybe he just had, you know, some bad pizza before bed or something. You know, he just made up some excuse. What's he doing? He's getting get dismissive. That's what time does to us. We get dismissive about the things that we know better about. And he wasn't given a second chance. He wasn't given a direct warning like Nebuchadnezzar was because the example of his father was his warning. That was his warning. This is what happens to people that get a dismissive attitude, Belshazzar. That's your warning. You had a perfect example of what happens. And what did he do? He disregarded it. <clears throat> if you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26. And when you get to Proverbs, uh, keep something there. We're going to come back once or twice this sermon. But, you know, Belshazzar had no excuse. You know, he saw everything that happened to his dad. God doesn't give him a dream. God doesn't send a man of God to warn him about the, what's got, what potentially could happen to him. He just goes about his merry way. And next thing you know, there's a handwriting on the wall. And then within a, within a day, he's dead. 
if you read the rest of the story, he dies immediately after that, practically. <coughs> and here's the thing. You know, these type of things happen, uh, you know, when these type of things go wrong in people's lives, when people's lives take a sudden, you know, sharp turn for the worse, it's not a coincidence and it's not an accident. Now, I'm saying, of course, there are accidents. I'm not saying every time something bad happens in somebody's life, they get in a car wreck or they get sick or something, that, oh, guess you didn't read the writing on the wall or, you know. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when we can, when a, you know, when a person can step back and see God's hand just judging them, you know, it's not because God's just up there toying with you. There's a reason why God's chastening people. Look there in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow fly by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. You know, the curse doesn't come to you like a bird. It doesn't just come, you know, a bird just wanders about wherever it will and wherever it lands, it lands. It's not just, want, you know, the curse doesn't just wander into your life. The judgment doesn't just fly by you one day and now it's something you have to deal with. It comes with for a cause. There's a reason why people get judged. There's a reason why Belshazzar, his, his days were numbered. It was, it was over for him. Because he knew better. Because he was accountable. And it's the same with us. The more we learn, the more we know, the more accountable we become. And if we be, grow dismissive and get this attitude of, I know better, it doesn't really matter what's the worst that could happen. The curse causeless shall not come. But mark what down, it will come. It's going to come for a reason. Go over to Proverbs chapter 29. Actually, go over to 2 Peter chapter 3. Proverbs 29 is probably something I've quoted so often from this pulpit that everyone in here has got it memorized. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Someone keeps telling you, hey, knock it off. You're gonna, it, 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 something bad's going to happen. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to correct you. Warning, 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 warning. Okay, that's it. Now you're destroyed suddenly. But it's not without a cause. And it's not that you haven't been warned. The problem is that people grow dismissive. Whether it's about salvation, whether it's about the, what, some sin in their life, their attitude, whatever it is. <clears throat> And what we don't want to do, how does this happen to people? So that, how does that even begin to happen to somebody? How does somebody fall into just becoming so dismissive of God that they just seem to know better than everybody and just brush everything off and not see where they're headed? I think a lot of the reason is, if you're there in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, is a lot of people take the long-suffering of God as a license to sin. They say, oh, God's merciful. He'll forgive me. I'll just do this, and I'll just ask God to forgive me later. That's not going to fly. He may or may not give you mercy. He may or may not. I don't want to take that chance. I think a lot of people get a dismissive attitude towards the warnings of the Word of God because of the fact they think that God's long-suffering, that I can just get away with whatever I want. I'll get saved later. I know God loves me. I'll just go live my life and do what I want to do, and, 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 and I'll get saved later. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. People just think, oh, God's long-suffering. God hasn't done anything. I've been getting away with this for so long. What's he going to do about it? It seems like God's not going to do anything. You know, and, and God's like, you know, I heard a good analogy about this, is that it's kind of like the difference between an on-off switch and a dimmer switch. Some people think God has a dimmer switch. That God just slowly gets angry. That God just slowly loses patience with people. And you can kind of see it coming. I don't know that I, I necessarily would, would interpret it that way. 
I think God's more like an on and off switch. I think the lights are on. You could see everything that's going on. You know exactly where you're at and, think, and, what, and you don't have to, you don't see it getting darker. Everything's bright. God's giving you plenty of opportunity to look around and take it all in and figure things out. And if you don't, one day the lights just go out. And all of a sudden that long suffering ends. And now it's time for judgment. And now it's time for God to have to do some, some you know, take care of business with his children. <clears throat> and look at what Peter's imploring these people to do here. He's saying, be mindful of the words of the holy prophets of old and of the commandments of the apostles. He's saying, pay attention and be mindful of the word and of the commandments. And don't let these scoffers in the last time convince you that God just doesn't care, that God doesn't see. That God's not really paying attention. That's what the world wants you to think. What are you following all those rules for? Why are you going to that church? Why are you, why are you dressing that way? Why aren't you coming out with us? Why aren't you running the same excess of riot as you used to run with us? Why, aren't you, why have you changed? Why are you different? You actually believe that? Look, man, we're getting away with it. Everything's fine. We've been doing this for a long time. Where is the promise of his coming? Scoffer is what they are. And they want to just bring you along and convince you that God's just not going to do anything about it. <clears throat> but what they're forgetting is what God has already done. Remember the flood? I mean, that's a pretty big example. I mean, how, 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 much, of a land, how much of a marker do you need to figure out who God is and what he, how he handles things? The flood, where only eight, everybody died except eight people. <laughs> it just kills everyone. And don't forget what he's going to do. You know, look at there at the end there. The, verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, the same words that brought the flood, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You know, God flooded it once. You know what he's going to do? What he's going to do next? He's going to torch the place. Yep. He's going to engulf it in flames. You know, we were just out soul winning the other night. We were looking at some old truck. Oh, wouldn't that be nice to have it? Someone made the comment, it's all going to burn. <laughs> like, amen to that. <laughs> well, that puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Right. I don't think I can live without that. Well, one day you won't. <laughs> and no one will. Everything you see is going to get turned to ash. But that's who God is. It's not that God has just forgotten, like, oh, yeah, well, wasn't I supposed to judge things down here? It's just that he is long-suffering. But we shouldn't just take that long suffering as, well, I, let's see how long I can get away with it. You know, God hasn't struck that match yet in my life, so I'm just going to see how far I can push the envelope with God. Because after all, God's long suffering. But you don't know where that line is. We don't want to find that out. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I guarantee you every person that's developed a dismissive attitude towards God and disregarded the warnings of Scripture, even when they knew better and thought, oh, the long-suffering of God is just going to see me through this and I'll get right later, I guarantee you every single one of them were taken by surprise when, God, when judgment finally came. Yep. They got out of bed that morning thinking they're just going to continue on their merry way commit the same sin that they've been doing and, and just con continuing down with the same dismissive attitude that they've had. They, and they thought, oh, it's just another day. And then, bam, God showed up and did something. And they were taken by surprise. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety. Oh, God's not going to judge. God's love. It's peace. It's safety. Where is the promise of His coming? Everything's continued since the day of our since the fathers have passed. Nothing's going to change. Come on, lighten up. Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Sudden. It's sudden because they're not expecting it. <clears throat> he says, "As travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape." But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let's mind our P's and Q's. 
Let's, let's take heed to the commandments and the words that have been spoken unto us and, and apply them in our lives and, and, and be careful. Let's walk on eggshells with God. Let's go ahead and get on the straight and narrow because we are of the day. We are not of the night. Let us watch. Let us be sober. For they that sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. They're, they're, they're in the darkness. They know not at what they stumble. <clears throat> you see, the destruction that comes upon these people there in verse 3, it comes and it's called a sudden destruction because of the fact that they were not expecting it. Not because God has a short fuse. Because God does not have a short fuse. The Lord is long-suffering. It's true. He is full of compassion and tender mercies. Amen. He's very long-suffering with people. But there is an end to that fuse. There is a point where, you know what, it, God does start to judge. And every single person that experiences that says, well, that was out of nowhere. That came out of left field. I didn't see that coming, Lord. And God says, well, you should have, because I warned you. <clears throat> and that's really the disservice that a lot of false prophets do to people. This is the danger that they pose with their false message of, God's not mad at you. God doesn't get angry. at We're all under grace. You know, we can get, we, you know, uh, there's now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. <laughs> you know, that's the danger there. Because all they're doing is just letting you go, oh, I guess everything's okay. Oh, meanwhile, you don't hear, on that fuse of God's, and then one day it's just boom, and you hear that. Then we pay attention. And they think, oh, well, God's not mad at anyone. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. Amen. Every day. Now, does he, is he whipping every single one of them every day? No, but he's angry with them. Go over to, uh, go over to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Don't take the long-suffering of God as a license to sin. Be mindful of what we've heard. The warnings that we've received from the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. And, 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 and walk the narrow path. Be mindful of it. Don't forget it. Don't develop a dismissive attitude towards the things of God. <clears throat> the Bible says in Isaiah ch chapter 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found, and call ye upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. You know, God's willing to pardon but you know, there's got to be some forsaking on our end. You know, maybe, maybe we're in a place in our life where the fuse is this short and we know it. <laughs> maybe the bomb's already gone off. Maybe God's already started to, to deal with us. And that doesn't mean it's over, folks. It just means it's time to forsake our way. It's time for us to forsake those thoughts. It's time to return unto the Lord. I mean, that's the whole point of God's chastening, is to bring you back. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, the Bible says. God's just always trying to bring us back when we get out of sorts with Him. <clears throat> and if you're being chastened, all that, that really should be an encouragement to you that you are born again. That's evidence of your salvation. What's evidence of the salvation? That if you go out and live a wicked life, God judges you. He chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. There's not a son whom he, whom he chasteneth not. And if you be without chastisement, then are you bastards and not the sons, the Bible says in Hebrews 12. But you know what? We need to, people need to, to seek him while he may be found. And they need to call upon him while he is near. You know, just that always reminds me of, of people who are just dismiss the gospel out soul winning. And it's sad. They just say, I'm busy. I'm cooking. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> I asked you if you knew if you're going to heaven. You said no. I showed and I said I could show you from the Bible how you could be hundred percent sure, but you're busy cooking. Right. Oh, the dogs. You think that's gonna fly with God? You know, I wonder how many people are gonna hear that when they when they when they stand before God at the, at the judgment throne. Oh, Lord, let me in. Sorry, I'm having dinner right now with my kids. Yep. Right. Sorry. Don't have time to hear you. Yep. You had your chance. <clears throat> but, you know, God is merciful. God wants to abundant pardonly, or excuse me, abundantly pardon. 
so we don't want to just get this idea. We understand that you know God isn't God isn't just some hothead up in heaven with an itchy trigger finger. Just like who can I get next? Which one of them's got it coming? That's not God, right? But we don't want to go to the other extreme and think that he's just some sappy pushover either. If you got something in Proverbs, go over to Proverbs 15 if you still got something there. I mean, God looks down. He's angry with the wicked every day. He's trying to reach them. He's saying, seek me. Here I am. Call upon my name. You know, uh, call upon me while I'm near. I will abundantly pardon. You know, he's not just up there. Well, man, you're wicked. You're going to hell. You're wicked. You're going to hell. I don't, you know, I'm done with you. I'm done. It's not, it's not like that. Look at Proverbs 15, verse 11. I think about this verse a lot. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. I mean, we step back and we think about hell sometimes. We go, man, hell is such a terrible thought. And it is. And we don't even like to think about it. We don't like to preach sermons about it. We don't like to read about it because it's such a horrible place. And no one wants to even think about it. Even if we know we're saved and we're not going there, we don't even like to think about that place. Right. We don't like to think about the fact that probably people we know and love are going to go there if they don't get saved. And we say, wow, that's, that's a real burden to us. And it is. I'm not making light of it. But this says that hell and destruction are before the Lord. And God sees it all. God sees the people that are there. God sees the people that are going to be there before they're even there. And God hears them and God sees them. And they're before the Lord. Hell and destruction are before his eyes continually. And that's why it goes on and says, how much more than the hearts of the children of men. God sees hell and says, I want to reach them. Who will go for me? Who will stand in the gap lest I should consume them? Right. That's what he wants. God is not just some hothead in heaven just pushing people into hell. The problem is, is no one will bring his message and save the people that would get saved. He wants to abundantly pardon. But we don't want to go, so we don't want to take it to that extreme and just get this idea that God's just up there just to drop the hammer on us anytime we step out of line. Like God's just up there, this mean old man with a bat. Like just give me a reason. That's not God. But there is a line that we can cross with God and we don't want to find out where that is. That's the warning. But let's not go to the other stream either and think that God's just some sappy, dopey old man that we can just push over, and that we can just pull one over on. The old man, he doesn't see what's going on and get sneaky. I love it when people, especially younger people, get sneaky. It's because they think they're being so sneaky and it's just all over their face, the sneakiness. <laughs> you know, they're coming in the door and it's like, <laughs> you know. I remember when I was trying to be sneaky. And just getting busted being sneaky. Like, oh, surely they won't notice. Because they, they think mom or dad are just kind of doing things. It's like they don't realize, I see you over there. I know what you're doing. I'm going to call you on it. We don't want to think that that's God. That somehow if we can just be a little sneakier, and we could just be a little craftier, that maybe we'll just get away with it. <clears throat> God sees everything. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So he's not just this sappy pushover who's just too fond of his creation to destroy it. Oh, I just love it so much. God's destroyed it once, he'll do it again. <clears throat> That's why it says in verse 10, if you're still there, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Oh yeah, God does see hell, and it bothers him. You know, the part, that part of him that is compassionate and long-suffering and doesn't want people to go there, he sees it, and the hearts of men are before his eyes, so much more so. But the preceding verse, it says, Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Make no mistake about it, as much God wants to abundantly pardon, if they don't get pardoned, that's where they're going. Yeah. And it's the same way in our life. You know, make no mistake about it, you know, you can sow to the Spirit and reap everla life everlasting. You can sow good things in your life and reap good things in your life by living for the Lord and not developing a dismissive attitude. But if you develop one, mark it down that you will reap of the flesh destruction. <coughs> so I think, you know, everyone get, that's the thrust of the message. Don't develop a dismissive attitude towards God in whatever area of life or whatever stage of life you're in. 
don't develop that because it's dangerous because there's consequences that are sure to come. And often those consequences are just built right in with the disobedience. You know, that the, the, the built-in consequences of sin. Sometimes God doesn't have to do anything. We just get involved in something we shouldn't, and it's just, it takes care of itself. The punishment's right there with it. You know, we start smoking. This is a, this is a good example. You just start smoking. God, you're like, oh, I wonder if God's going to judge me. Well, maybe when you get lung cancer, you know, well, I guess I'm reaping what I've sown. Yeah, that's God's judging you. That's his law. It's in place. <clears throat> those of us that understand this, you know, those of us that go, yeah, this is all right, this is true, and we've been acting accordingly, you know, we, should, we, should under, we understand this, but let's, let's desire and endeavor to be like Daniel. And this is what I want to close on. If you would, go back to Daniel chapter 4. I should have you keep something in Daniel all, all morning. Let's be like a Daniel. Look, we know this. We understand this. This isn't a mystery to us. Maybe it's a refresher. Maybe we need it. Maybe some of us were getting a little dismissive and just need to be reminded, hey, this is who you're dealing with. This is God. You know, he chastens, he judges, he has a limit. You can't be sneaky around him. Don't get dismissive and everything will be okay. But if you do, you know, look out. <coughs> we get it. We understand that. So let's, those of us that do, let's go ahead and just endeavor to be like Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 4, verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was a stony for one hour. When he heard the vision, and he was given, told, interpret this for me, Daniel. It says his thoughts troubled him. The king spank and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream and the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, you got it coming, Nebi. Everything you got coming, you deserve because you're just a big puffed up whatever. No, that's not his answer. That's not his attitude. His attitude was, my Lord, the dream be to thee them that hate thee. He's seeing what's coming and going, this is terrible. I got to tell this guy that his kingdom's going to be taken from him and he's going to go lose his mind and go eat grass like an ox. I mean, that's bad news. No one likes to deliver bad news. And he's, go and he's dishing out some bad news this time. And he's saying, Lord, let the dream to be them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. This would be, I don't want this for you, king. He says, but it says there, his thoughts troubled him. You know, it should bother us that people are going to be judged unnecessarily. I mean, why am I even preaching this morning? Why am I preaching this sermon like this? Because I don't want anyone in here to be chastened or judged by God unnecessarily. Amen. Don't, I don't want any of you to have to pull an ebby. <laughs> you know? Let that be to your enemies. Let it be the, the, those that hate thee. Not to you. Let somebody else get judged. So let me warn you about the dismissive attitude and the dangers of it. Because I don't want that for you. I don't want you to be like Nebuchadnezzar. It bothers me. And you know what? It should bother every one of us that there's people out there that are going to be judged unnecessarily. It should bother every one of us, every single one of us, that there's somebody out there that's going to hell that wouldn't if we would just go preach the gospel to them. If we would just take some time out of our busy schedule and go out there and just knock their door and say, do you know for today if you, if you died, you'd go to heaven? There's people out there that would get saved if we would go. And praise God for, 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 for everyone that goes. But we need to never lose sight of that. That's why we do what we do week in and week out. Because it should trouble us that people are going to be judged unnecessarily. <clears throat> and we don't want to develop this, again, this idea that, that, that God just is somehow just calloused that, to the fact that people are going to hell. Or that his children are going to get judged. He says in Ezekiel 33, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? You say, why? Why are you going to do this? You don't need to do that. You don't need to be judged. You don't need to suffer this punishment. You don't need to, I don't, I'm not going to be, I have no pleasure in your death, in your destruction, in your judgment. He wants people to turn. <clears throat> so and here in our text, in, in Daniel 4, 9, or 4.19, he says, you know, his, his thoughts troubled him, and, and obviously he was so troubled by it 
that finally the king has to speak up and say, Daniel, just tell me. I could tell you, you know something. What is it? You know, what's wrong? You know, <laughs> lay it on me, Daniel. That's what he says. Belteshazzar answered and said, you know, he didn't hold back. Let's be like that with Daniel. Let's be like, let's be like Daniel in that way. Let's not, let's preach the truth. Belteshazzar answered and he said, yeah, it troubles me. You know, it's so troubling. It's such bad news. I probably shouldn't even tell you. And is that an attitude we should have? What if I had that attitude as a preacher? You know, 1 Corinthians 5 is pretty rough. You know, the Bible says this over here. And you know, the Bible says this over here. And, you know, that's pretty bad news. And I, I surely wouldn't want to cramp anyone's style or bring anybody down. So, you know, we're not gonna, we're, I'm not going to preach that. No, I'm going to be like Daniel. I'm just going to preach it. For your sake, you know, keep me right, you know, as a preacher, but also to make sure that you don't suffer unnecessarily so that if you do go ahead and disregard God, if you go ahead and, and get a dismissive attitude and disregard the things of God and the preaching, the word of God, then it's not on my hands. It's on yours. <laughs> he preached in the truth. And that's what we need to do. The Bible says in Jude chapter 1, Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. You know, on some we should have compassion, is what it said to Jude. Others, you know, we should <laughs> save with fear and warn them. You know, we're all, you know, likely I'm sure 99% of everybody in this room is saved this morning. And I don't need to save you from hell, but let me go ahead and try and save you this morning from, from the chastisement of God in your life. Let me go ahead and try and save you from the judgment of God in your life this morning by putting a little fear in you. Not fear of me, but fear of God. Because, you know, the fear of man is a snare, but, you know, the fear of God you know, is the beginning of wisdom. If I can get, if I can get people to, to know what the Bible says and say, look, we should probably be afraid of God, <laughs> then people can start growing in the Lord. And they can move from the place of being afraid to the place of doing things out of love and so on and so forth. But we got to start somewhere. And, we, and fear is the beginning of wisdom. He's saying, look, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation of thine enemies. It's good to save people with fear too. It's good to take, challenge people sometimes you know, when we're out there and say, hey, look, what you just said is wrong and, and the Bible has a different answer. You need to hear this. You know, and if they refuse it, say, okay, but just know that the Bible says that according out of your words out of your own mouth, that you know, you're going to hell. That's not always the easiest thing to do, but you know, and we want to use tact, of course, but that is the message. Others save with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And if some have compassion making a difference. That's what Daniel did. He's saying, Look, the dream to be them that hate thee, the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. And he's saying, he's trying, you know, that's a compassionate attitude that Daniel has. And that's what we want. If you would, let's go over ahead and turn over one last place. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So if we understand all this, we understand the dangers of having a dismissive attitude, we get it. Then, then the challenge this morning is to be like Daniel. To go ahead and preach the truth, whether they like it or not, but to, and, to, and to save some with fear and with others to have compassion. <clears throat> and it should bother us <coughs> that people are being judged. Now here's the thing. <clears throat> in, this, in this idea of having compassion, you know, I believe the way we can really do this is the fact that the way we could kind of play this out in our life is that we don't have to go out of our way to offend people. I feel like sometimes people get this attitude like, let me just go out of my way to try and offend somebody. Even if what we're saying is right, even if what we're saying is true, it's biblical, it's righteous, let me just go out of my way to see if I can trigger this person. I know they don't like the Bible. I know they don't like God. I, don't know, I know they don't like the fact that I'm a Christian. So let me just rub their face in it a little bit. And where do you see this? On vague book, I mean Facebook, right? That's where you get a lot, you see a lot of passive aggressive kind of things, you know, for people like, they know if I post this, you know, on my, on my Instagram or whatever, that it's going to, somebody's going to be mad. It's, someone's going to put a frowny face on it, right? 
But here's the thing. You don't have to go out of your way to offend people. It will happen naturally. You know what I've discovered? If you just live your life for the Lord, if you just try to you know, keep yourself out of hot water with the Lord and, 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 and live as you should, godly in Christ Jesus, it's amazing how people just naturally be offended. I mean, if you like offending people, you know, living for the Lord is the best way to do it. And you don't have to put hardly any other effort into it. You don't have to put up the, the passive-aggressive post. It'll just happen by your life. Why? Because man, by nature, is contrary to the Word of God. Man's nature, all on its own, is contrary to the Word of God. So when they see you living for the Lord, when they see you, you know, doing the right thing, and they ask you a question, you give them a biblically sound answer, that alone is going to bother them. That alone is going to trigger them and offend them. And all you did was try to show them some compassion. All right? If you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are a savor of death unto death and to the other a savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? You know, I don't have to try to preach a sermon to offend people. If I just get up and preach the word of God, I will be a savor of life unto life to some people and of death unto death to others. Because people will walk in here and they'll have a nature that is already contrary to the things of God. Now, so if, when I present the things of God, they come into conflict and they're offended. And it's the same way in our life. If we just, you know, live a godly life, it's gonna, it's gonna rub the, it's gonna rub against the grain with some people. It's gonna rub the fur the wrong way. But you know what? The cat can turn around, as the saying goes. So let's not get caught up in trying to just offend people. Let's sh let's be like Daniel. Why? Because we understand the danger of a dismissive attitude that people adopt out there. We understand where people are headed. We're like Daniel. We can, we can see the writing on the wall. We know what that means. We can, we can interpret the dream. We can say, look, this is what's coming towards, to you. So what should be our attitude? Just, eh. Or should it be, hey, you know, let me try and help this person out of compassion. Let's, not, let's focus on not letting the old judgment or excuse me, let's, let's focus on let, not letting our old nature, because by the way, just because you're saved doesn't mean you know, everything's brand new. All things are new in Christ, we understand that, but until you die and go to heaven, you still have this flesh to deal with. We still have this old nature to fight every single day. Paul said, I die daily. He said, I bring my flesh into subjection, lest, by any other, by, uh, lest, uh, lest I should, when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. He said he had to do that every single day. He had a fight that he fought every day with his own flesh. And you have that too. Just because you're saved doesn't mean it's over. You know, you, you, now, you have, now you're at war. There's two natures in you now when you're saved. Which man are you going to feed? The old man or the new man? That's the question. <laughs> so don't fall into this trap of developing a dismissive attitude and focus on not letting that old nature bring judgment upon yourself by adopting that attitude. Let's go ahead and pray.